So I tried to simplify that to our understanding. So the title of my sermon today is Prayer and Prophecy. Prayer and Prophecy. I went to spend some time with Tim Messer and his mother Shirley and his wife Amy on Friday. He described to me a few weeks ago he was jogging on Tridelphia Mill Road. An elderly couple knocked him down in the morning. He was thrown out a few feet and he was flown to shock trauma. He was in Maryland shock trauma, a compound fracture on his right leg. And they put bolts and screws, 10 weeks of recuperation. The question that Tim and his wife Amy asked me, Pastor Paul, why things happen over and over again for those who love the Lord? Because Tim Messer went through a major surgery of his legs. And now, this accident. For, for a minute, I need to quietly think about how to answer. I brought up the story of Joseph. So Joseph was beaten, almost killed, sold into slavery. He was lied to, put in prison. For 14 long years, there was absolutely no answer from God. One thing led to the other. He was suffering. And at last, God gave him the answer. So, in short, I want to tell you, family, if you're listening this morning, you remember what I shared with you on Friday. All things will work together to them that love God. All things, good and bad things, for our ultimate good. Joseph did not know when it's going to work for his good. For 14 years, he did not know. So when we pray, we like instant answers. Sometimes God will give the answer immediately, but the fulfillment of that answer would take time. Sometimes God kind of stretches things out in answering the prayer. In the same way, Daniel, the prophet, questioned God. Lord, I want to pray to find out how long your people, my people, would have to suffer in slavery, in captivity. Now turn with me to, to uh, Daniel chapter 9. Daniel 9. I'm going to read first three verses. In the first year of uh, Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, by descent a Mede, who was made king over the realm of Chaldeans. In the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, perceived in the books the number of years that according to the word of the Lord to Jeremiah the prophet must pass before the end of the desolation of Jerusalem, namely 70 years. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking Him by prayer and plea for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Daniel apparently studied prophecy or read the Old Testament. Now he is quoting that Jeremiah said that we will suffer for 70 years and will be restored. And Lord, when that is going to be? Now turn to Jeremiah. I'll read that to you. Jeremiah 25, 11 and 13. Jeremiah 25, 11 and 13. 11, 12 and 13. Jeremiah 25. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon seventy years. This is Jeremiah now prophesying. 
Then it will come to pass, when seventy years are completed, that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, says the Lord. And I will make it a perpetual desolation. So I will bring on that land all my words which I have pronounced against it. And all that is written in this book which Jeremiah has prophesied concerning all the nations. Apparently, either that is verbally passed on to um, Daniel or he read something that was written by Jeremiah. And I want to point out one phrase here, in fact two. The first one is perpetual desolation of Chaldean. You know that is, even to this day, that land is barren. It is Iraq. Babylonia is not built. That prophecy is to this day's perpetual desolation. Now, the next thing, he said 70 years. Now, same Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 10. I want you to listen to this message carefully because this is prophecy. There will be some numbers and there will be some fulfillments. Listen to this, okay? Jeremiah 29, 10. For thus says the Lord, after 70 years are completed at Babylon, I will visit you and perform my good word towards you and cause you to return to this place. Now, this is what Daniel read. The first year of King Darius, historically put somewhere in 383 B.C., now, 383 B.C. is probably little more than 20 or 30 years after they were suffering under captivity. Daniel is so concerned, and he read 70 years, Lord, how long we are suffering. It is always difficult to wait on the Lord. Daniel found that difficult. Especially when we are suffering, it is not easy to wait. It's like us waiting for 2024. I wish it comes tomorrow. So it's, it's hard to wait. You cannot patiently wait when you are suffering, physically, mentally, even otherwise. It is difficult. It was difficult for Daniel. And now he prays. Before I get into his prayer, I did not put any Fill in the blanks for you except saying the first point, unanswered prayers of the people in general. Why God sometimes will not give answer to our prayers. I'm going to quickly go through the nine points, nine bullet, nine bullet points in your notes. And I did not put any fill in the blanks for you to listen to me and also read the scripture when you go home. Let me quickly give that to you. The first reason that God may not listen to our prayers is that a prayer without faith will not find answer. James chapter 1, 6 through 8. But let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord because he has a double mind, unstable in all his ways. It's simple. A prayer with doubt will not be answered by God. Secondly, a prayer that is not made in the name of Jesus. John 14, 13. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. Why do we have to pray in the name of Jesus? In the scripture you would find that Jesus is our intercessor. He sits on the right hand of the Father with mourning and groaning, interceding for us every day. So we pray in the name of Jesus. I get really worked up when politicians sometimes pray. We pray in the Almighty God. I understand that. But you have to close in the name of Jesus. Have you noticed that people are scared to mention the name of Jesus these days? They don't want to. That is the name in which we are called to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And when we finish that, for thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory. God taught us to pray in the name of his son, Jesus. If you don't do that, don't expect any answer. Number three, 
A prayer that is not in the will of God. 1 John 4, 14 and 15. I'm reading all this scripture, but go home and read them again. And this is the confidence that we have toward Him, that if He ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if you know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Knowing the will of God is the question. We have to pray in the will of God. How can we know the will of God? It is pretty simple. When you seek to edify one another and glorify God, you will find the will. Which means if your life is focused on glorifying God all the time in everything you do. Lord, what would you think? I'm going to do this. What would you think? I'm going to plan this. So when you think, Lord, I want to do that which glorifies you and edify others. I'm not selfish. I want to pray a prayer that will help all of us. Then you'll find the will of God. A prayer that is not made in the will of God will not be heard. And number four, a prayer is not made under the direction of the Holy Spirit. Jude chapter 1 verse 20. There's only one chapter there. But you, beloved, building your, yourselves in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit. Which means when you pray, don't pray in your flesh. Remember the prayer of the publican and Pharisee? They both went into the temple to pray. And uh, the, uh, the publican said, I tithe, I fast, I give it to God. He was making a list of things he was doing. But the, uh, the poor man, the, the publican, the Pharisee is the one who gave a list. The publican went in there and he said, Lord, have mercy on me. You know what it means? Lord, I'm just seeking you. I want to pray in God the Holy Spirit. I'm not like this Pharisee listing things in my life. Okay, and number five, a prayer with sin in heart, God will not listen. If you have sin in your heart, God won't listen. Psalm 66, 18, if I have cherished iniquity in my heart, you will not hear. Psalm as David is clear. If I have sin in my heart, you won't listen to that prayer. Number six, a prayer with unforgiving heart. Mark eleven twenty five. And whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone so that your Father also who is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. In other words, if you are unable to forgive somebody so and so in your heart, how can God forgive you? How can, how can God listen to you? Cannot. A prayer with unforgiving heart cannot be heard. That's why in the Lord's Prayer we also say, Forgive our trespasses as we forgive those trespasses against us. Pretty simple. You cannot expect God to forgive you until you forgive somebody that you have not forgiven in your heart. All right, number seven. A prayer with enmity in the heart. Matthew 5, 23, 24. So if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift just there before the altar and go. First, underscore that, first be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. This is very self-explanatory. If you have enmity in your heart, you can give it to God, you can come to worship, you could hear the sermon on uh, online, but God is not going to listen to the prayer if you have not reconciled to the one that you have enmity. And number eight, a prayer with no compassion and kindness in your heart. I was putting it down. I was so intrigued by this point when I put it down, the scripture that I read. Remember the scripture that we all know, ask and it shall be given to you. Knock, it shall be opened to you and seek, you shall find. And it's good to hear that. It's so good. But you don't sometimes read the context in which that was written. The context is this. Let me read that to you. Which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me. 
the door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, which means cockiness, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, what it is is that you could be a wonderful person, but then if you don't have compassion and kindness in your heart to help somebody in need, you can ask God and, and the doors will not be open. So the context in which that one was given, ask and it shall be given because you give it to somebody in need. You open the door of kindness. If you're unkind and you, if you are cocky and not willing to help anybody, then how can you expect God to open the door? He can't. Number nine, a prayer without confession. James 5.16, Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Confession, prayer of confession. Now, Daniel was living the other side of the New Testament. I think I read uh, most of the scriptures, if not all of the scriptures that I gave unanswered prayers from the New Testament. But Daniel, he knew that he had to pray in the will of God, in God the Holy Spirit. He needed to be a compassionate man, unselfish man, seeking God. So it says, the first year of King Darius. King Darius, was, he was ruling between 550 and 486 B.C. And this prayer, the first year was 487. I calculated all the time, trust me. It was only about 40 years. In 40 years' time, Daniel was impatient because he read Jeremiah saying, 70 years, you'll get back. It's only 40 years, Lord. Now, can I ask you, when? He knew 70 years. So, the second point is answered prayers of a godly man. I wanted, I wanted to give you the unanswered prayers so you will know when we pray how we should pray. Now, look at how Daniel prayed. Daniel 9, 3. Then I turned my face to the Lord God, seeking Him by prayer and pleas for mercy with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. Daniel's posture. Daniel had a goal to reach through prayer. He approached God with this humility. He was convinced in his heart, Lord, I want to fast in sackcloth and ashes. Daniel was determined to humble himself before God. Now, at this time, Daniel was higher up in that kingdom. As you know, that Babylonian king made him a leader. And right after the Babylonian king, the Persians and Medes conquered Babylonians. Now, Darius was a Persian king. As a matter of fact, by descent, he was a Mede. Now, during this time, Daniel was a higher official. Now, he is sitting in sackcloth, fasting and praying. Legalists would say these days, we need to bend our knees and pray. Sometimes we pray like that. Lord, I bend my knees and pray. Literally speaking, bending our knees has been traditionally known in uh, the medieval time. As a matter of fact, in Europe, they still bend. Whoever can bend their knees, they do. And of course, in, in big churches, they have a cushion for you to bend, put your knees on. It's okay. But you know what it means is this. Listen to this carefully. The posture of Daniel means humility, humbling oneself before God. People can kneel down, yet their hearts could be far away from God. So it is the humility of the heart is what should be the posture. If you want to bend down, well and good. I'm not going to say against those who bend their knees and pray. You do, sometimes. When I prepare my sermon, sometime I get off my uh, recliner and kneel. I said, Lord, I'm, I don't know. Give me good understanding. My mind is clouded. 
It's okay. If you can't kneel down, that's fine. You may be laying in your bed, but your heart should be humble before God. That's what it means. Posture should be humble. Daniel humbled himself. Secondly, Daniel's plea. Verse 4 through 15, but I'm not going to read all that. But look at this. Daniel confesses the sin of his people, glorifies the goodness and righteousness of God. O Lord, he prays, great and awesome. You are an awesome God, keeps his covenant and mercy with those whom he loves. We have sinned and committed iniquity. Righteousness belongs to you, but to us, Shame. Instead of complaining, he is confessing. See, we do not obey the voice of the Lord our God because we don't confess. We're supposed to go before God and confess. Confession is important to God. I know it's an intense study. But I, I want to interject a humorous story. A Catholic priest and a, a rabbi, they were so close. They were so f good friends. Every time the Catholic rabbi goes to see the priest and uh, he would look at the confession booth and they say, what do you do there? Well, they come and give a confession. I said, okay. And uh, the priest told the rabbi, he said, what do you do? I said, what do you do if they confess once, tell them they have to pay $20, all right? And uh, if they confess twice, tell them $40, all right? And then can they do two, two confessions? Yeah, they can do that. And then a day came, the priest had to go somewhere. He called the rabbi, would you sit in the booth for me, please? People would come and confess. I said, sure, I would. A guy came over. And then, uh, you know, you can't see and said, uh, uh, Father, I want to confess. What do you want to confess? You know, I uh, committed a very bad sin. He said, uh, you know, I, I stole money from the bank. Oh, okay. And then, but you know, I'm confessing it. But, but I'm going to give God $80. So he gave $80. And then, you remember, remember the, uh, uh, the priest told him, there's one confession 20, two confession 40. But this guy confessed once, and then he gave $80. And then the rabbi didn't know what to do and said, hey, go back and do three more times because you paid $80. <laughs> That's not the confession that I'm talking about here, okay? But here's Daniel's purpose of confession. Daniel chapter 9, 16 through 19. His purpose was forgiveness and restoration. Let me read that to you. O Lord, according to all your righteous act, let your anger and your wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem your holy hill because of her sins and for the iniquities of her fathers. Jerusalem and your people have become a byword among all who are around us. Now therefore, O God, listen to the prayer of your servant and to his plea for mercy and for your own sake, O Lord, make your face to shine upon your sanctuary, which is desolate. O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations and the city that is called by your name. For we do not present our pleas before you because of our righteousness, but because of your great mercy. O oh Lord, hear. O oh Lord, forgive. O oh Lord, pay attention and act. Delay not for your own sake, O oh Lord, because your city and your people are called by your name. What Daniel is praying, Lord, the purpose of my prayer is I want, I want your anger to, to kind of hold on. And I want you to forgive us. I want you to restore us. He was confessing genuinely. 
And he, he's asking, Lord, I want to cause your face to shine upon the holy hill, meaning Jerusalem. Daniel was consumed by the glory of God. He said, I want to restore the glory. He was not praying selfishly. So unselfish prayer. And he's praying, Lord, have mercy on us. Oh, Lord, hear. Oh, Lord, forgive. Oh, Lord, listen and act. Daniel was wrestling with God. Now, as he was praying with the right posture, with the right plea, with the right purpose, I come to the third point, which is very important for us to pay close attention to. Immediate and the end time answers of prophecy. What happened here, let me read chapter 9, verse 20 to 26. Immediate and end time prophecy. I'm going to show you some PowerPoints for you to get this understanding. Now let me read the, the first five verses, or I should say from 21 through 26. Daniel 9, while I was speaking in prayer, that means Daniel was praying, the man Gabriel, angel Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the first, came to me in swift flight at the time of the evening sacrifice. Apparently, Daniel was sacrificing morning and evening. He was praying. He made me understand, speaking with me and saying, Oh, Daniel, I have now come to give you instant understanding, insight and understanding. I put instant understanding, my word, in there because it's important to know that Daniel was answered just like this. At the beginning of your pleas for mercy, a word went out. So Gabriel spoke, and I have come to tell you this. For you are greatly loved. Apparently Daniel was loved in heaven. Therefore consider word and understand the vision. Okay. Now Gabriel is speaking to Daniel and said, I'm here to give you answers. I know you read in Jeremiah. I will give you the answer. Now let me follow. 24. So he was, he was actually asking for 70 years. Daniel was asking, Lord, I read 70 years. But Gabriel said two things. The first thing he said, 70 years. And also he said, 70 weeks. Let me explain that to you. Verse 24. 70 weeks are decreed upon your people and your holy city to finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal both vision and profit, and to anoint a most holy place. Know therefore and understand that from the going out of the word to restore and building Jerusalem to the coming of the anointed one, a prince, there shall be seven weeks. Then for 22 weeks it shall be built again with squares and moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince, underscore that, who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with the flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Aye. To understand this prophecy, I need to explain that to you carefully. The first one Daniel was asking, I read in Jeremiah, we are in captivity here in a foreign land, Jeremiah says 70 years, how that's going to be. And now that was answered in the PowerPoint there. Jeremiah's 70 years. Look at the timeline there. The captivity of the people began in 606 B.C. Many Israelites were transported to Babylon as slaves. Jerusalem was destroyed in 586 B.C. And remember Cyrus, the king, gave permission for Nehemiah, Ezra, and Zerubbabel to take the people and go back? The year was 536. Now look at the timeline precisely from 606 to 536 B.C., 70 years. So what Jeremiah prophesied will be fulfilled in his lifetime. Seven years. 
70 years. I'm not sure whether he was still alive, Daniel, when people returned, but I do know Ezra was alive, and then Nehemiah was alive, Zerubbabel was alive, because they were the ones led the people. Daniel must have been in his 90s at the time, perhaps even close to 100 at the time. Nevertheless, and this was the prophecy. Gabriel said, that will be fulfilled. That's the immediate fulfillment. Daniel was asking, Lord, answer me. He was praying, Lord, I'm praying. Give me the answer. God gave him instantly through Gabriel. It will happen. Okay. And also, I'm going to give you another prophecy. Look, this is what happens. When you are so faithful to God, God will reveal things more than what you should know and will give you a good understanding of it. Prophecy on the end times. And he is now speaking, Gabriel is speaking to Daniel. Seventy weeks are decreed. Now the uh, theologians, pastors archaeologist, and everybody concluded the 70 weeks are seven sets of seven years. Let me explain that to you. How would they conclude each week is a set of seven years? How would they conclude each day is one year? So how would they conclude one week, seven days, is equal, equivalent to seven years? How would they conclude 70 years times 70 years would be 490 years? How would they conclude that? I'll explain that to you. We have to go back to the Old Testament, and I'll read that to you. Uh, or maybe you can go back home and read the story. Genesis 29, the story of Jacob in Laban's house. 29, 15 through 28. Remember, Jacob went to his uncle's house. He wanted to marry who? Rachel. But the father, the uncle said, I want you to work for seven years first. And I'll give you. Of course, uncle cheated him, gave him Leah instead of Rachel. And Jacob said, I'll work for seven more years. Would you give Rachel? And uh, the father said, yes. So the term used there for seven years is Shabua in Hebrews. Shabua is the word used for seven years, also used for one week in Hebrew. So the Old Testament people read that word because that's the same word in Hebrews used for 70 weeks. He said 70 Shabuas, which means seven sets of 70 weeks, 490 years. I'll explain this to you again. So in the PowerPoint, one week is equivalent to seven years. Each day is a year. Keep that in mind. Seventy weeks, what does it make up? Seventy years times seventy would be 490 years. Now Daniel probably did not have a clue except knowing these seventy weeks could be 490 years because he had probably read the Old Testament stories of what it means in Hebrews. But we live on the other side of the prophecy, so we could go back and prove those 490 years to be true. Now here it is. Daniel's 70 years can be broken into four parts. I want to simplify it and give it to you clearly. And Gabriel said that seven weeks will take for you to build the streets, walls, the entire town. So seven weeks would be 49 years, right? Seven weeks would be 49 years because one week is 70 years and seven times seven would be 49, rebuilding. Now you might ask, did it take that long for them to build? If you read in Nehemiah, it took 50, 52 record days for them to build the wall. But Gabriel said the entire city, the streets, walls, Jerusalem temple, and the courts, and the altar, all of it would take 49 years to be rebuilt. You know who completed the building of the city and the temple? It was Herod the Great, just before Jesus was born. So it took 49 years for them to, everything stretched out from the moment they started building and gave some gap, so the building project itself took 49 years. Every now and then it took a break. 
And when Herod completed it, Jesus was born. Then, you would know, 62 weeks, Messiah would be cut off. That's what he said. He would be cut off. Now, look at this calculation. From the time people of Israel started coming back to Jerusalem, started restoring the temple and the city and everything else, until the week of the triumphal entry, it was 463 weeks. 63 times 7 would be 483 years. Precisely. 483 years until the Messiah would be cut off, which means he would be crucified. So now going back, how in the world we would say that one week is equivalent to seven years and 70 weeks is equivalent to 490 years? This is precisely how it was fulfilled. So 483 years from the time people started coming back into the promised land until the week Christ was crucified, 483 years. Now there's one week left, that is seven years left. And that's what he said. Half week, which is three and a half years, is Antichrist would come. And then another half week, which is another three and a half years, Antichrist would make a treaty with Israel and he will break the treaty. And that's what he mentioned here to give a clear understanding. He said, put an end to sin. This world is filled with sin. If you want to put an end to sin... When Gabriel said, it means devil is taken out. It means after the time of tribulation, Jesus would come with the saints. Devil would be tied up in the book of Revelation. Thousand years of reign with no sin. Gabriel said that. When? To Daniel. Thousands of years before. Precisely fulfilled 483 years. Now we're waiting for the last. Let me explain that to you. There is a gap between 69 and 70th week. Nowhere in the scripture, nowhere in the prophecy, God revealed that gap between the 69th and the 70th year, week, which means between 483 years and 490 years and that gap look at this the next one it's called the period of grace look at the PowerPoint clearly 483 years from the order to rebuild the city until crucifixion then comes the church age in which you and I live Nowhere in the scripture it says how long. So we are living just before the 70th week. And then comes, if you click again, the 70th week will come, which is the week of the tribulation, seven years. Spelled out, seven years. Antichrist, we all will come. But before the tribulation, and I forgot to put that, there will be rapture. We all will be raptured. Now, the only way I could explain why God is delaying, why that grace period is so stretched, beautiful Bible verse, turn with me if you will, 2 Peter, 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3, I underscore that, very important, 8 through 10, 2 Peter 3. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So ever since Messiah was cut off, it's been, what, 2,020 some years. Maybe it's only two and a half days for the Lord, I don't know. According to this, let me continue. The Lord is not slow to fulfill His promise as someone counts slowness, but 
He is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. That's the definition of the grace period. Don't, don't consider that God is slow. He's not slow. He wants everybody to come to know the Lord Jesus. He wants everybody to repent. He does not want to send people to hell. He wants people to come to Him. So that's the period in which we live. Grace period. God is delaying because He wants everybody to know Him. Now in short, I'm going to ask you, Daniel prayed a prayer counting all nine things that God won't answer into account. And he qualified himself, I want to pray. He prayed in God's will. He prayed to glorify the Father in heaven. And he prayed having no enmity in his heart, even though he was under Babylonian captivity. He had no enemies, even though they tried to persecute him. And he had nothing against anybody. He was so compassionate. And he fulfilled all nine things that I said God would answer. And then he humbled himself. He prayed, plead with God, and confessed the sins of him and his people. And God gave him a wonderful answer of immediate fulfillment. In 70 years, you will get back. That did happen. Historically recorded. You don't even have to go to the Bible. Go and Google when they return. Precisely 70 years from Babylonian captivity to return of the people. And then 483 years fulfilled from the time it was built and the time Jesus was born and walked in to Jerusalem. These were all answered to prayer. God gave Daniel this wonderful prophecy. How is your prayer life? We are living in the 11th hour. Are you ready to meet the Lord? He may come like a thief. Pray in the will of God to please God. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Those of you listening online, God is slow. He's delaying. The delay is called grace because He does not want anyone to perish. Hell is not made for man. It was made for devil and his cronies. But unfortunately, many would choose to go that broad way. The narrow way would lead to eternal life. The Lord does not want people to be on that broad way. He, want, he wants everyone to come to the narrow way. If you're not a Christian... I plead with you, come to know Jesus. Rapture could take place in our lifetime. For that matter, the next hour, the next day, or next 10 years, or 100 years, 500 years. We don't know. It's, it's a gap. Period of grace. Come to know Jesus. Be ready. If you are a Christian, and you prayed and prayed and your prayers are not being answered. I want you to check those nine things. Make sure your prayer would line up with the things that God does not like. So you remove that and then pray like Daniel. With humility, with please, that includes confession with the purpose of forgiveness and restoration. God will restore you. Dear Lord Jesus, we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. No one is righteous, but you are righteous and holy. Restore us. Restore those Christians. Restore our country. I pray like Daniel, Father, how long? Let every church in America, every pastor in America, every Christian in America bend our knees, which means in humility and with confession 
pray that it would heal our land. How long the unjust would rule. How long immoral things would take place. How long the laws would be undermined. How long Christians would suffer. Oh Lord, I pray that you would put an end to that. And also, Lord, we know clearly from Daniel that you will come soon. Help us to be ready. If there are people not saved, may they come to know Jesus. Lord, I'm just waiting for the day in which we hear the trumpet sound. It would be translated without seeing the last week. I don't want to see the 70th week. I want to be with you. Father, none of us will want to go through that. Help us all to be ready to meet the Lord. Now, Father, I pray, whatever we are praying, help us to pray just like Daniel so we would receive the answer. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, thank you. You all have a wonderful fall afternoon.